Um, just a little bit about uh, the constellation problem. Um, so the, the uh, sort of origins of everything that uh, we worked on um, was to create a horizontally scalable uh, consensus protocol. Uh, and in order to uh, basically allow for um, distributed consensus to be integrated within um, some kind of like you know, big data tools that uh, you guys could hear about it, you throw some buzzwords out there. But basically, how can we take um, the original notion of a blockchain, which is a distributed system that operates in serial? So, like every single node uh, has to um, process the same information as every other node. Um, like, how can we actually turn that into something that's parallel, uh, or at least as parallel as we can get it uh, concurrent? Um, and sort of out of that uh, whole process, um, we found that the only the one way to achieve this was to provide incentives for nodes to one validate information, but also to optimize their network topology. How can we ensure that uh, the network is set up uh, and, and resilient enough in order to provide the kind of uptime that you need um, for some kind of like consumer enterprise grade backend? Um, and then also, how can we turn this into some kind of like uh, subscriber based data validation tool so that can integrate uh, within you know any kind of data pipeline? <coughs> Um, natively, natively integrate and interoperate, or you know, do something simple so that um, this could at least connect, uh, you know, on an API level. Um, so it's worth mention mentioning a couple of things um, before I get started because we, we do have a, a couple of architectural considerations that are different um, than a lot of very common projects. Um, one thing to note is that uh, we focus on double spend protection using account chains. Um, so the uh, TLDR on that is that every individual references the previous transaction in order to give a relative ordering to uh, all transactions that are being processed. Um, and what that means is that if someone actually were to try and do double spend, um, they have to fork their own chain, um, which is like you know, easily uh, viewable for people. Um, and um, it it's really helps us uh, with two things, ordering, since uh, Constellation is um, eventually consistent and we process information in parallel, so we don't have um, total understanding of all the information at any moment, even for like, the full and um, correct conditions. Um, and then also that uh, it leaves up, it's kind of like, um, it basically leaves up to the account holder to be uh, honest and we can think of like that. Um, also, uh, we handle um, uh, consensus and uh, facilitator selection um, using a deterministic federation. Um, this is similar to something like a distributed hash table, like on Lya or Core or things. If you guys have ever seen that, um, we'll use a deterministic uh, distance metric in order to um, enforce some type of uh, invariant on data with the album, which, in the simpler terms, um, that helps nodes tell each other what to do in a deterministic way so there's no sort of confusion. Um, and then also, uh, this scheme can be used as well within uh, gossip routing um, to allow nodes that don't have the total state of the network uh, to participate um, and provide actual like, work and validate information. Um, that's a bigger topic that I can talk about later, but just, just worth mentioning um, in case you're just like, well, this is there's a lot of stuff here. I'm just not about this matter yet. Um, and so uh, one other aspect too, and I'm sort of going to get on to the, the fun, interesting stuff, um, is that in sort of this type of model, and the thing I'm trying to focus on, um, that uh, efficient applications uh, in, in this realm that we're focusing on state channels or processing uh, domain-specific information, as opposed to like the smart contract kind of problem with that protocol, um, that is really all, this, our, our focus is really all around uh, data locality, or optimal data storage. How can we represent information um, in a distributed way, uh, in such a way that we can, or that the protocol can be resilient uh, and orchestrate itself um, with minimal supervision by the people who deployed most of this. Um, and, and the way that this is handled, as, you know, as mentioned before, we use a deterministic um, uh, distance metric uh, called ZOR in our case. Um, but the actual data structure itself, the data dependency graph, forms uh, hierarchical edges. Um, so obviously, like, uh, we were in ag protocol, so we had, you know, as opposed to a really blockchain, um, we form a graph of blocks. Um, in this case, uh, these blocks themselves, in between state channels, can form uh, 
greater hierarchies, if you will, re referencing each other. Um, so you can also think about this uh, in terms of like a recursion scheme and things like that. Um, so it's, it's very similar to that. Uh, basically, you can form composite uh, DAGs in your network out of the results uh, of other networks as well. Um, it's really great for, for solving issues with table locality, um, uh, which is kind of like the name of the game of, you know, Posting this info in a non redundant way that solves certain scalability problems. So, um, a bit more on that, uh, and sort of like the core of today's talk, which is how can we actually um, create some kind of uh, elasticity amongst um, you know, clusters that are running a blockchain protocol? Um, and first off, like, what do I mean by like elastic? Um, so, often, like, oftentimes, uh, if we're trying to aggregate information, um, we might need to uh, increase or decrease the amount of resources we've allocated to um, some type of a problem uh, in order to handle increased load or decrease like load. So basically, if you've got like a hundred node Elasticsearch cluster um, and you know you're processing like a terabyte of information per second, I don't know, it's like a Twitter virus thing. All of a sudden, that, that drops down to like you know a megabyte. Um, you don't need that entire cluster, so it's just it's not advantageous for you to keep that up. So what you want to do is reduce that by reducing the number of nodes that are available um, and do that in such a way that it's graceful um, and that hopefully doesn't take, uh, isn't a huge headache for the people who are responsible for deploying and, and maintaining that. Um, so this is known as like elasticity. Um, it's also really common for uh, data processing jobs like Hadoop or Spark where sometimes there might be an issue, uh, especially if you're running it in an untyped way like a Spark or something um, that could cause a corruption or crash of your nodes. Um, it allows for the cluster to restart itself and try to retry um, in, in, in a graceful way. Um, so it's, it's sort of a core backbone to um, a lot of the data pipelines that people use when they're processing um, a lot of unstructured information. Um, so it's really the, uh, the, the whole goal here is that basically we want to make sure that the resources that we've allocated actually match um, the demand that's necessary. Um, it's really just the best practice and kind of uh, also bottom line for a lot of folks. <coughs> So the notion of elasticity in general, um, well, it's, it's a really hard problem, but it's also way more difficult um, for peer-to-peer -peer networks, especially stateful ones. Um, basically, I'm uh, gonna talk about our, our favorite little friend, the, the cap here today. Um, basically, like, uh, in, at least in the context of like Bitcoin per se, um, Bitcoin really needs to rely on uh, partition tolerance. Um, that's actually kind of like the name of the game of like why its consensus model um, really applies a lot. Um, you know, every single node being in sequencing of information um, because of you know how it how it can uh, it's subject to forking. Um, and then also there is all the, the question of if you, you get two, then you know, what are the two in the cap room that you want to choose, right? Um, so typically like in the real world, it doesn't actually like add up to be like I'm perfectly partition tolerant and I'm consistent, right? There's always some give or take, some trade-offs. Um, so for instance, what happens uh, like with Bitcoin is that um, when blocks are created, uh, there is sort of like an acceptance time where things are um, pending until there are enough children underneath that such that um, there would be a longer chain that could be proposed, uh, at least probabilistically, that that block would get lost. Um, so it's actually sort of like a uh, loss on consistency um, in order to ensure some notion of availability. We can at least see that um, the transaction that was uh, proposed has been is pending now, um, which isn't like incredibly available because if something is highly available, we didn't even assume um, that we see it you know, being appended to uh, I guess in this case the ledger, but at least like it's been read and written uh, immediately. Um, still very slow, but we at least get a taste of both, right? Um, well, when we're in the kind of um, space right now, where or at least with our type of problem and, and the space of trying to um, apply like consensus or get that to, to integrate with um, you know large scale data processing, um, what we really need to focus on is actually um, availability uh, as opposed to partition tolerance or consistency is very important and so is partition tolerance, please excuse me for saying about, but availability is really the, the game. Um, we want to make sure that we process this information and at least have an understanding of what we process as quickly as possible. Um, it's, it's kind of like the, the backbone of, of, you know, especially like all the apps and things that we use um, on a daily basis. So um, sort of the sort of the thing that we uh, had to, to focus on 
Um, was how could we like make sure that we had a protocol that ensured availability, but didn't uh, sort of like stamp on the budget and all that consistency that we all required. Um, and uh, you know, sort of, uh, there's almost like a, um, I'm gonna say. There's a relationship in this problem between partition tolerance and consistency in such a way that um, monitoring one can help infer and make decisions to improve the other. There's almost like a cyclical relationship, I would say. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting uh, where this came from. So um, one approach that uh, you know we, we've used uh, is using minor like redundancies, at least, uh, in terms of like the, the like node kind of thing, um, to help improve partition tolerance. This is kind of like the same kind of overlap you see with HDFS. Um, which uses uh, you know its own kind of like redundancy schemes, uh, obviously with the HD kind of thing. That's that's more in line with us. Um, but then again, uh, you know, any kind of like you know sorry, me, any kind of cryptocurrency um, really needs to rely on global state and, and convergence of global state, um, mainly because uh, of the notion of like validated rewards or how do we make sure that people who are participating um, are actively like you know incentivized and not basically like. What happened here? Did someone mess this up? Why didn't I get my token or whatever, right? Um, we really need to make sure that there are guarantees, um, at least in the long term, on what happens, such that you know I don't wake up and my money is. Um, so yeah, consistency really is the uh, aim of the game for for building cryptocurrency. And what we what we found is that with the cyclical relationship, that we could actually take um, some approaches in um, in the space around like uh, reputation modeling. Um, peer to peer network, something called Eigentrust, uh, which is used by another uh, cryptocurrency called NAM. Um, and a lot of, and it's, it's actually kind of like a de facto kind of model um, where it essentially does an eigenvalue decomposition on a graph of edges that represent trust uh, and then gives you principal eigenvectors out uh, that you know, help you understand like what's the total sort of state and the relative state of each person in terms of how they're trusted by their peers. Um, but there's also uh, another metric, um, or I think it's a, I think measure. I don't know if I want to go down that road, but I believe it's a measure that can be triangular quality, quality whatever, um, called node accessibility, uh, which has been used to understand how well uh, a node inside of some type of a, a network can access other peers. Uh, basically, if I start with a starting node, um, what's the probability that I'll be able to reach any other peer in the wider network? Um, uh, it's sort of a rudimentary way. Um, here, I actually just threw the, the most canonical definition, which is just the exponentiation of channel entropy over um, the edges going out of each node. Um, I, I could get into that later, but uh, we actually have some related work in uh, our economic model that directly ties to that channel entropy value. Um, but I, I think that's for another talk. But very interesting stuff. Um, and it also gives us an understanding um, of this partition tolerance as well. Right? But, but this partition tolerance that we're measuring is on, on edges that represent trust, which also help us understand, um, is there going to be a discrepancy amongst the nodes um, such that if there is a low discrepancy, that means that the total state will converge in a reasonable time. So we're going we're gonna to get there. Um, and so yeah, I probably should have switched to the slide. But basically, we all need a uh, global agreement. Um, it's an interesting paradox too that that um, sort of goes in line with this uh, this kind of feedback loop. Um, yeah, it's, it's basically just uh, you don't want to wake up and have your money disappear. So the solution um, was twofold. Uh, basically, one we wanted to use you know obviously something that um, is sort of a de facto like trusted approach called Eigen Trust. It's been used before. Uh, helps us understand uh, in like the actual like influence, if you will, or the relative trust every single person. Um, it converges globally, so that's great. Uh, and also, there are already implementations, great. And we also, um, but the real question here was, how do we, you know, what do we even decide upon to globally converge, right? Um, because possibly every single node could have a different state, um, and so that's, it really just begs this question, like. How can we make a decision locally and have some kind of an at least probabilistic guarantee that that will converge globally? So fortunately, that uh, accessibility measure that we talked about um, can be approximated using a type of random or, or random walk. Um, specifically, we use one called a self-avoiding uh, random walk. Um, and what it does is it helps us locally converge to what we will, based upon what's provided to us from our peers, um, essentially 
it helps us get a view of what all of our peers think about the wire network. Um, and by using that view, or these views, um, we can all decide together what is a, an actual outcome that will help the wider network um, converge in a reasonable time. Um, and I feel like I should say this now before I, I jump uh, into the rest of the stuff, that basically the most computationally expensive operation that you will ever encounter in, in like, you know, distributed systems is just sending stuff over the network. Um, the whole kind of like mantra to like the big data world was send operations, send a query, send code to where your data is stored and send the result. Perform the operation uh, on the actual where the data is stored directly, like in reference of the data locality, um, and uh, try to make them as embarrassing and parallel as possible. Great. I just wanted to, to break that down. So, um, the real goal here is that we want to minimize the amount of data that's set up the network so we don't have to wait for a long time in order to have the network convert to a global state. That's a self avoiding walk. You just can't cross yourself. And that's just a GIF of an eigenvalue of decomposition. Um, that's actually part of like an SVD or something. I don't know if it's the best, whatever, but it's, it's a cool GIF. Um, anyway, so why I call it me, right? Like, what, what's that, right? And it's not, it's not, not just like aliens, it's not because they're awesome, but, uh, but it, it's actually just something that kind of came out of it, right? Um, so basically, like, if, if you take the definition of it from like Wikipedia, um, it's some kind of a common idea or behavior, you know, amongst a community of things, right? So this actual self-avoiding block is an iterative function system that tries to understand commonalities between each other peers' worldview. Right? Um, and by doing that, we can locally make a choice of what we think a global view, view will be, um, such that the actual output of the rest of the you know, total state of the network will be a small set of unique, diverging, but easily decidable values. Something where it's like, if we have 100 nodes, you know, the vast majority of the responses will be towards one proposal, and we can pick the majority or you know, sort in the case of time. Um, just kind of so this is the actual algorithm itself. Uh, I read this from the hot off the press paper that is like going to be sent up to GitHub and archived <coughs> very soon after this stuff. But basically, um, there's a sub process that runs uh, at all times uh, on our nodes. Um, we are constantly sharing information of uh, well, basically we're always sharing blocks with our peers, at least in terms of light nodes, right? Um, and in that case, uh, inside of our blocks, we have a, a data type, uh, at least in constellation, called an observation, uh, which stores information about the behavior of each individual peer in the network. Like, did it did it time out when we were trying to read down some information or during a consensus process? Um, are these consistent, right? And what we do is we constantly update our local worldview um, using the self avoiding block. So we constantly <coughs> aggregate these um, observations. Once we hit uh, you know, a certain time trigger, we then retrain the walk, um, and we constantly try to keep that as up to date as possible with new information that hasn't been committed to the global state yet. Then, um, once we've reached our snapshot, or once we've been proposed a snapshot, which is what we call our global state, that has um, a height to it, which means that um, that is beyond a certain threshold. Uh, it's just configurable in order to make sure that um, convergence happens in a, in a Know, appropriate time. Um, then we wait uh, all of the proposals by peers by our local score. Um, and then we propose the highest scoring one to all of our peers through a broadcast. And then we deterministically select one of those. And we take the results of that to retrain eigentrust, uh, which will give us those deterministic outputs for validated rewards and whatnot. Um, and then that, that eigentrust uh, state will become the new base state that every node makes its local decisions from. So we all start from eigentrust, we start adding new observations, and then we update that, that local state. Um, so yeah, so there's a little uh, interesting nuance to this as well, um, which is just something that came out of um, you know, testing it. Basically, um, and also just an understanding that you know, any kind of these models, we need in any machine learning model in, in general, um, not in any model, I take that back totally. Um, obviously, I don't supervise them anymore. But in our, in our case right now, um, in order to actually understand uh, some notion of commonality, right? Um, it's typically, like at least from my own 
view, and I think it makes sense. Um, you really need to have, or actually to ensure that it converges as well. I mean, you need some kind of baseline commonality, right? Um, we need to have you know, something that acts almost like training data, if you will, um, to this model so that uh, we can try to capitulate towards you know, some type of a understood true state, right? Um, so we call uh, actual nodes uh, that are performed in a, in a, you know, consistently well um, a seed node, and we give them a higher weight. Uh, and that is something that is determined um, actually on the, on the local basis. And um, actually, excuse me, that's determined uh, on the eigentrust basis. And then we have the, what we call generator nodes, um, which uh, just sort of a term that came from some other work uh, called generative economics um, that created this process to create an uh, economic model that was based in actually like some unit of disorder, entropy, and it's all facts and events of everybody walk. Um, and then those are actually weighted directly by the local scores. Um, so that's uh, that's actually how this weighting occurs. And this is actually kind of like the cool part where we can tie in uh, other types of proof models, like uh, proof of work, proof of stake. Um, you can use the actual mechanics of how you tie break to select your seed nodes. Um, and then those seed nodes are what everything in the wire network tries to capitulate towards. Um, but what we did uh, was a little bit different because you know, we really focus on um, calling. Actually, uh, why? Do you want me to tweak that for you? Oh, so you don't have to be. Oh, it's okay. I'm almost. I'm actually kind of almost done. But uh, thank you. Um, so what we did was we actually came up with our own proof model um, called proof of reputable observation, uh, which is essentially something like uh, kind of like induced churn is the is the phrase in DHTs, um, where you kind of try to reshuffle um, identifiers around your nodes around uh, on the actual cluster itself to make sure that the that each node is accessed um, in the most like equal. Kind of like a rate possible. Um, it's all like in DHTs in general, sometimes you have a problem where um, certain nodes get access to more than other ones um, that can cause, cause problems. Um, it, it's sort of you know akin to that, but not 100%. It's just sort of a, a you know, thought process. Uh, but basically, as, as nodes, uh, nodes can basically shift up and down um, in terms of relative ranking um, based upon how they perform over time. So if a node is constantly like Doing perfect um, with its network connectivity is amazing. Um, if it doesn't have reports of you know, conflicts or misaligned data or being offline, then what we want to do is we want the rest of the nodes to capitulate towards that. We want to make sure that their behavior um, is exemplified uh, and that the rest of the, the network will be here. I'm going to move to that slide as well. Uh, but basically, yeah. Uh, that's it. And uh, so we want to always cross notarize observations as well um, to add uh, some type of you know, understanding as to who is proposing what and make sure we can you know, identify um, or at least have some forensic information if there was some kind of like line weight type of strategy. Um, so the real focus here was just to talk about convergence. So I wanted to just talk about um, the, the most important kind of like result here, um, which was tuning the like ratio of seed nodes and generator nodes. Um, and, and here on this, this plot, you can see that as we increase the seed node count, um, we dramatically reduce the amount of unique proposals that each node makes, um, which just reduces the amount of traffic that needs to happen across the network. Um, so that's that's kind of the end result here. We wanted to find something that was really close to zero, um, so we knew that we weren't doing broadcasts, uh, huge ones all the time, just to converge to global state, um, which is cool. I, I should have put the commit on this slide, but um, the actual commit on here is not GitHub. And we want to do it and generate some testing. So. Yeah, there is a lot of extra stuff, though, that could be done with this. Um, and so I just wanted to share some future work because um, this actually just came from our first implementation, um, which, I mean, it works fine, but obviously, like, you know, it can always be better. Um, so namely, like, we could also add uh, other weighting schemes on top of the generator um, nodes, um, similar to something that uh, another process that used Red or another model um, for blockchain networks, um, this one more so. Um, on uh, basically preventing attacks, but um, there were some real um, interesting results in a paper called Guru um, that uh, might lead to something. So in terms of weighting generator nodes and their weights on top of the actual um, localized trust scores, so it's something that we're looking into. Um, but also, what's what's really kind of like the the lead and something that I'm I'm definitely going to do 
um, be improving and, and uh, in line with probably splitting the actual um, modeling process of its own project, um, is that we need to, uh, we, we can totally, you know, modify our implementation of the self reporting model um, in order to just be a lot, um, a lot faster. Um, right now, we're only running one iteration, but if we're able to increase um, the amount of time that we train that model, um, that would also dramatically help um, the rate at which we converge. Um, and it, we started out using a library called Breeze, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, it was like a, a matrix operations uh, that were all optimized with I believe JBlast, but um, without getting into it, um, it's great for crunching numbers and Scala, but unfortunately there's some issues with something called implicits, and we ended up just finishing the rest of it because we needed the data, data types. So um, we can totally refactor this, make it a lot faster using Breeze, have a way better API, and split it into some projects. So. Um, that's sort of where we're going with this. Uh, we're going to see where those improvements take us, but we've had some success so far um, that we were happy to share with you guys. And uh, if anyone finds this interesting or wants to do some stuff, um, let's see the plan work we have. So that's, that's all I got. Uh, thanks again for having me, guys. I, I hope you found this interesting. I hope any of you guys, when you build your protocol, like, want to try to use this as well. Um, and uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just wide at Constellation Labs at IO. Email me my notes on Twitter. And uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions, I'd love to chat or laugh and stuff. Thanks, guys. Are there any, um, sorry, I just, are there any particular use cases or people kind of approaching you guys where they say like this type of approach in this protocol is, is they're, they're better served and just kind of what, why their decision and kind of going that way? That yeah, um, yeah, totally. So, I mean, at least in terms of like us and who we've been talking to, um, it's, it, our, our real focus and kind of like the value prop is around uh, just adding security to like data pipelines or basically um, how can you add OAuth to like a device um, is a great kind of a, a question, right? And, and make sure that that is audited throughout um, some type of an indexing pipeline. Um, so folks are really uh, concerned with security, um, but also processing a lot of information and understanding, um, you know, networks of, of processes that are based around that pipeline. Um, can really get a lot of information and guarantees um, around like what data was produced, where is it going, and uh, you know, are there holes that can be in their system? So um, I, I can't really say a, a whole lot yet about um, our most recent like project, but. Um, you know, stuff in line with that. Um, we've been working with the Air Force on and um, a couple of other folks as well on um, our website. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned earlier this is a public blockchain. Is there the option for it to be hybrid? And, you know, if, if people want to keep some data private, you know, to not have to put it out on Oh yeah, I mean 100%. So um, with the approach that we have towards like application support, um, which is we wanted to create like a framework for state channels, creating your own um, independent like network that can process your own user-defined data type. Um, you can decide what level of centralization, decentralization, public-private that you want. Um, us ourselves, like you know, with our public network and uh, DAG, or our jumping which which runs on that. Um, obviously, we're you know we exist in order to provide some type of a payment channel for open state channels. Um, but obviously, for some folks, like you know, they, they want to have it private, and we totally support that. Um, and the tool is just as useful for that approach as well. So, uh, after you convert to your native chain from ERC country, uh, what kind of wallet do we have to use? Oh, it's a great question. So, we're, so we're building one right now um, that you'll be able to download. Um, and uh, basically, like, we'll, we'll have it available for you. Um, so you use your own wallet? Right, correct. Um, I always forget the, sig the, the signing thing that we use, but um, I forget, but basically I've taken the, the exact same um, the exact same methods that we use for, for signing uh, you know, transactions in our um, like test environment, our random transaction manager, um, and just created an executable that goes into a UI wallet. So it's if you've ever used, um, I mean, if you've ever used like, a, let's say, what was the Ethereum like client? Yeah, the wallet. 
MetaMask is the browser one, right? Mm -hmm. Mist. Mist, I think that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> I don't know about that, but Mist I think would be a good example, um, and so it actually would run um, in the browser. But um, it's yeah, basically it's going to be its own its own wallet, um, and uh, you just need to create your own um, key, and you'll be able to do that. So, so, are you able to issue our own coin on top of your chain, or just like on the chain? So that's a great question, um, and. I would say that it depends based upon what the state channel developer actually wants. Um, so you will, if, when you create your own state channel, have the ability to tokenize the data that you're processing. Um, but I mean, if that's something that doesn't have value to the person who's developing it, then maybe it doesn't make sense. But um, I would love, I mean, my kind of like dream vision of all of this is to create like, um, you know, units of value around individual data types uh, themselves. So I'm, I'm hoping it'd be kind of like, uh, you know, my own ERC-20 kind of thing. I mean, if that's, you know, what you want to do. Cool. Good? I'm kind of yeah. curious, as, as you guys were going along, um, in things like, like Hashgraph and uh, like IOTA is kind of like an IOT specific, but like so, some of the other projects that we're using a slightly similar like data approach. Is there was there was that something you all looked at and decided like this there were these distinctions in terms of what you guys wanted to do in terms of doing your own own project? That's a, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so you know for what it's worth, um, you know, Constellation, like I started working on it and, and thinking about how to do like a DAG before a lot of these things like came out, like like pre hash graph. I honestly think I, I personally like I just decided to go full steam with this when I wrote the plasma white paper, um, which was the first kind of thing after IOTA that I became aware of. Um, but in general, um, any kind of like scalability problem that we're folk, that we're dealing with um, with blockchains in general, um, typically like it's 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 rooted in the issue that um, these approaches are a distributed system that operates in serial, so it just doesn't really like. The whole reason why we build distributed systems is so that we can have multiple nodes process part of the total load and help increase you know, the whole efficiency, right? Um, so there's just an inherent issue with that, and that's what all DAG kind of try to solve. Um, but as things kind of progressed, um, and we sort of, you know, personally, my, my whole idea was like I wanted to build something that I could build like a serious, you know, application, so we can process time of information for folks. Um, and so um, I kind of moved away from how do I put this? Um, we have a subtle nuance that's different than the other folks um, in order so in order to um, process more information in parallel. Um, so if I were to actually give a direct analogy, if you look at the tangle, um, what they do is they form a data dependency graph on transactions themselves. Um, but what we do is we form a data dependency graph on, on blocks. So um, the transactions and all the block information is really just um, whatever one node is perceived, and it all only is what one node has seen, um, and then it's proposed to the wider um, network. So there's a few other benefits there going on. It's a little bit different than perhaps like uh, like Hashgraph's approach is, is more, um, it's actually a lot closer to um, the original trust chain, um, which I don't want to go down the rabbit hole there, but there's sort of the trust chain world, and I'd say that we're a little bit more close to the IOTA data dependency graph than that. Are you using the technology uh, from SWORD? Oh, what? SWORD? There's something called SWORD, right? I think oh, yeah, 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 the hash graph, SWORD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. SWORD, yeah. You, you, you pay. You pay them to use their license to, uh, to use their technology, or no, no, no. We, we built our own protocol. From so scratch. nothing was just work. No, no. They're they're just a similar like DAG protocol approach. Okay. Is, is this scoring configurable, or it's more exclusive for uh, each? So is the scoring scoring configurable uh, based on the particular uh, application? Oh, totally. Yeah, absolutely, um, 100%. Uh, and I also highly encourage anyone <laughs> who... <laughs> um, so in the future, I want to make sure that uh, all of these, you know, whether it's the scoring mechanism, whether it's a certain level of parallelism, like how many nodes do you actually want to form consensus? Um, do you not even want to use this and just have proof of authority or proof of work or something like that? 
Um, kind of our goal here is to provide whatever people want for their state channel, um, but just to allow for their channel to be interoperable with the rest of them um, using our, our application. Um, so yeah, and uh, this is also really common too. If you've ever used like if you've ever like deployed like a Spark cluster or like Elasticsearch, any of these things, um, there's a lot of different configurations that you can change for your specific use case. Um, on the one hand, it actually, you know, to be honest, it makes my life easier as a developer to be like, it's on EDOC, but um, it's also way better for people who really want to build a performance system and spend time trying to make something perfect for the use of it. So uh, that was a long way to answer to say yes. Hey, yeah. Thank you for coming out tonight for us. Pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think through the, the use case of, I don't know, 50,000 internet IoT sensors and everybody in. It's not all about the same. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question about incentives. And in particular, I, I, I think I'm tracking what you guys are doing around the network coming to con consensus on, say, analysis of the data. But what about the data coming in? I mean, what, what, right? So if I'm a drug manufacturer and I want to throw my data in with a couple other drug manufacturers, but I mean, people F with data all the time, the LIBOR schedule. Right. So I, yeah. I'm just curious. <clears throat> I'm curious to get your thoughts and reaction to that. It's obviously a very hard problem. Yeah, totally. Um, so I don't like, I don't have a solution to incentives or. All right. That was weirdly timed there. That was kind of scary. Yeah, man. Um, all good. So I don't necessarily know how to, let's say, um, incentive problem, I guess you'd say, around how do people sell their data or find a way to compete in like in vouch for it. Yeah. yeah, well, vouch, I, I mean, vouch, we have an approach. I mean, I don't know, perfect, but in terms of like coming up with incentives, that stuff's really tough and nuanced, and I'd say that I think it's just going to be something that comes out um, okay. now organically. But in terms of actually implementing some kind of like a solution to the oracleization problem, however, right. um, that is actually something that we do do. And uh, if you built something we call a digital twin or a digital twin um, that runs on any Android right now, so um, for instance, like uh, we've learned from folks that a, a big company that you guys, you know has had an issue before where someone has spoofed um, access to a remote vehicle, not even using a cell phone, they just picked up some kind of a, you know, a packet that went there and they stole your car. Um, and, you know, currently, like, there, there's a real problem, like, how do we actually handle key management with that and how do we make sure that that's up to date? Um, so, we're just like, let's, let's build that and um, basically uh, the same kind of approach that we it's the same approach that we already had from the get-go. Is we need to associate each individual data producer um, with some type of a unique identifier that is also um, given some kind of security guarantee of as good as your key management can be. Um, that was, once again, really bad. You need to associate, you can associate a data producer with a public-private key pair, and if you're the person who owns that data producer, um, you can get guarantees on the actual, like, you know, how that device is producing that data um, up to like the security of that private key. So that's one way to do it. Does that make any sense? Yeah, but I, 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 I'm very concerned about the, I mean, I'm very, I think the Oracle problem is a really, really hard problem to solve. I'm a big fan of decentralized solutions to it and, I, um, and, and where the monetary incentives come into play rather than just a security. I, I don't mean to tell any, I oh, tell yeah. this whole thing, but like, I, I don't think it's a question of simply getting hacked. I think it's a question of people uh, spoofing data and having massive billion dollar incentives to fake data, which is what happened with the people's game.